Thank you so much, Professor Andrew, for an amazing talk. Uh, unfortunately, you didn't leave us too much time for questions, maybe. Oh, but I we have over? enough for a few. Did I go over? Uh, yeah. So we'll yeah. try our best. Time um, I did an episode on time perception. It was like a two, <laughs> two hour and 45 minute episode. So I, I don't track time very well. Um, I don't do anything quickly. I don't do anything quickly except eat. I eat very fast. Okay, let's All right. do it. We can start with the first yeah. question. Which behavior or habits have the most impact on our health and performance but take the least effort to incorporate in one's life? <laughs> I think I know who asked this. So for the next two and a half hours, I'm gonna, no. Um, okay, I, well, I think you probably know the answer. I'm probably, they're gonna be shoveling dirt from my grave or lowering me down and I'm gonna be still saying like, get sunlight every morning into your eyes. Um, I, can't, I can't overemphasize this point. I think that's the key one, morning sunlight. Again, even if there's cloud cover, it, if it doesn't transform your sleep and feelings of well-being for no cost, right? I mean, I didn't create this mechanism uh, for sure. Um, I'll be very surprised. And I would say that one, and then I think having a, I would say the 10 minute a day non-sleep deep rest is truly transformative. And what's cool about non-sleep deep rest is you get better at it over time. So you can learn to drop into this deeply relaxed state more quickly and pop out of it. And it's pretty remarkable how much better you feel afterwards, regardless of what state you were in uh, heading into it. I, you know, again, it's a zero cost tool. It's anchored in a lot of good biology. And, you know, if I have one wish for, I have many wishes for humanity, certainly. But if I could emphasize two wishes for humanity, it would be, viewing morning sunlight as a, as a dedicated practice to do all the things I mentioned before and to do non-sleep deep rest, um, at least 10, but ideally uh, 30 minutes a day. And if you don't do it every day, it's not a big deal. You can do it every other day. There are no rules that say you have to do all these things every day, except the morning light thing, get the morning light thing every day. How did COVID affect the general state of stress? <laughs> and has that changed now? And has that changed now with the return of normality? With what? I'm sorry. With the return of normality. Has normality returned? Here, kinda. Yeah. <laughs> Has was normality ever here? Uh. Really <laughs> Not here, here. Actually, of any. I mean, yeah. I mean. Science oh, and cocktail? This, this is a hard one. Um, and not because I want to be politically correct. You know, I, on the podcast and in social media, I never touched the, the vaccine issue, right? My response to this is always the same. It's the same one I'll give now. I had nothing to say that hadn't been said by somebody before. Not to be cryptic, but what did we see in 2020? Um, it's just not my expertise. I'm not a virologist. Um, what did we see in 2020? We saw people really stressed because of fear. We saw people really stressed because of the social landscape. We also saw people indoors more, for sure. We saw people ambulating less. That's geek speak for walking. When we move forward through space, when, not outer space, I'm not Elon. When you move forward through space, something very interesting happens. There's a pattern of eye movements that actually shuts down or at least limits neural activity in a brain area called the amygdala. Years ago, people asked me about so-called EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing, this where people sit in the clinic and talk about a traumatic experience, move their eyes from side to side, and I was like, this is crazy. That's what I thought. I'm a vision scientist and I work on stress. No way. Then I get five papers to review separately. Mouse, mouse, monkey, human, I think another one in human. Which show that the eye movements that occur with forward ambulation actually quiet the amygdala, a brain area that's actively involved in generating feelings of threat detection. Very interesting, right? So during the, the pandemic, people were moving less outdoors, right? They were stress for all sorts of reasons. So I think many of those things have improved, and yet I see the world, at least parts of the world that I'm in, in a kind of a post-pandemic bit of a, if you were to look at the stress response, it's more of a kind of a passive disengagement, kind of a, like no one's, we're kind of braced for something. We don't really know what we're braced for, and we've had some horrible events in the US recently. I mean, I realize it's a Friday night and this is supposed to be festive, but it's just, just terrible like tragedies recently. So I think what's happened is our nervous systems are primed for detecting problems, and it's going to take a very active effort 
to calm ourselves to be more adaptively responsive to things. And I wish that there was a solution, but I actually think there is one, but it has to be self-generated. You can't control someone else's nervous system. You really can't. I mean, you can try, but you can't do it. And so one of the reasons for sharing these tools is to try and get people to realize I can become more resilient. I don't have to be anxious. I'm not joking here. I can literally force myself to take a cold shower, do cyclic hyperventilation, and I can be calm because as Spiegel pointed out, I induce that state, so I control it. Very different than when something comes along and kind of smacks us square in the face. So the short answer is, um, I think we are in a stage of more normal behavior and kind of socioeconomic landscape, more or less, but I think our nervous systems are still feeling the reverberations of the last two years, and I think it's going to be wild. And think about the passive plasticity that occurs in young kids. I think they're the ones that really, really need the tools. And they're in the perfect place to benefit from these tools. Again, none of which I designed. They don't cost anything. These are, these are tools that were installed in us, right? It's physiology. Do people with higher cold tolerance have a higher stress tolerance? Does it help just being born in Scandinavia where people are brought up in the cold? Like no, a I have some Scandinavian mechanism. relatives that don't like to be out without a, a scarf, so I'm, uh, okay. Um, well, there is this, oh gosh, there's a Swedish phrase that was in the press release for Suzanne, Dr. Susanna Soberg's beautiful paper, and I, someone said, knows it, please shout it out, because I'm not going to, and I can't remember it, and I don't speak Swedish, so I wouldn't know what I was saying anyway. But the translation is something like, in the warm months of spring, wear a jacket, so that you are more heat tolerant in the summer. Weird, right? But not so weird. And then in the cool days of fall, wear fewer layers so that you are primed for and able to tolerate more cold in the winter. Why? Because that cold exposure causes through the release of adrenaline, which triggers the the accumulation of brown fat, which by the way is good fat. It exists around your spinal cord and some of your internal organs. It's kind of like the oil in a candle allows you to feel warmer at cold temperatures. So Scandinavians, I think by virtue of being exposed to these extremes in temperature are more tolerant, but if you're bundling up too much, then you're not going to build that tolerance. So it was that 11 minutes per week, not per session threshold that seemed to be the threshold. Um, And again, I'm now I'm paraphrasing Susanna's work in in more detail than I should. So uh, she's the expert um, if we were to go deeper into that. Did you have to deal with stage anxiety or similar things? You look so relaxed. How do you deal with it? Um, Well, as my amazing, truly amazing colleague, Carl Dyseroth says, he's a psychiatrist and a bioengineer and is like taking these genes from algae and put them into these things that allow us to control the activity of neurons. He's gonna like someday cure all these psychiatric illnesses. He's like, again, one of these people, like who are these people? can do all this stuff, has five kids, and like, you know, wrote a book. Um, as he likes to say, we don't actually know how other people feel. Now, we rarely understand how we feel. But the, the short answer is, um, ever since I was this big, I've been blabbing to people about stuff I find really interesting and I think they should know. Yeah. And they did take me to a psychologist. And so I've been blabbing to that same psychologist since I was 13, 36 years and still going. So it's a compulsion. I, I have sort of a scientific Tourette's. And so I don't, <laughs> and so I don't think about my, like, my nerves. I'm just yeah. truly excited to share the information. Um, so no, I don't get stage fright, but, um, but I get frightened about plenty of other things in life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can workout and training also disrupt, disrupt your sleep? Oh, yeah. So we didn't talk much about exercise because, uh, as I've recently discovered, if you're not a physical therapist and you talk about exercise on the Internet, you are inviting war. <laughs> um, but I also like to say that the great thing about an academic training is that it teaches you that like, criticism is good. You can grow from criticism. So I'm going to try and say some things without offending too many people. I don't think I will. First of all, let's just stamp down what the research, the the sort of center of mass of research says about exercise. It's pretty clear that getting 150 to 200 minutes and probably more like 180 to 200 minutes of so-called zone two cardio per week, this is is a great thing for your health. And that we should all be doing at least that. And that might seem like a lot, but at least that. 
walking around Copenhagen, cycling around, that's kind of zone two. If you can do that exercise while purely nasal breathing, you're likely in zone two, whereas if you pushed any harder, you would need to mouth breathe. Not that mouth breathing during exercise is bad. Mouth breathing is bad during sleep and mouth breathing is bad at rest. So, not good. Good, yeah. okay? The other thing that's very clear is that even for people who don't want to grow muscles, it's clear that getting about six sets of res kind of hard resistance training per muscle group per week is important to maintain skeletal muscle. And that's important for everybody has very little to do, that statement has very little to do with anything aesthetic, although it does affect aesthetics, has everything to do with maintaining strength and resilience and not getting injured from falls, which is a major source of the need for surgery and, and actually mortality and all sorts of things as we get older. So what can we say about exercise? Well, why, and why did I kind of sneak in that little exercise thing? The zone two cardio you can do pretty much at any time of day or night and not disrupt your sleep. Resistance training, because the final repetitions of that set should be hard, there's a lot of argument if it should go to so-called failure or not, but because they should be hard and challenging, sometimes there's a lot of adrenaline that's, that's secreted. Some people do better by making that early in the day, and some people are okay to do that late in the day, but in general, here's the way your day works neurochemically. From zero to about nine hours after waking, let's call this phase one of your day, Cortisol, epinephrine, dopamine, and norepinephrine kind of predominate in your system. And these are ratios, okay? These aren't absolutes. You are primed for energy output and focus, et cetera, especially if you slept well the night before, even if you wake up really slowly like I do. Then from about 10 hours until about 16 or 17 hours after waking, there's a shift, and there's more of a tendency for things like serotonin and other neuro chemicals, they're actually so-called neuromodulators to be present, and those lend themselves better to states of, believe it or not, creativity, states of kind of active exploration of ideas and brainstorming, and for less high intensity energy output, less structured output. And then from 17 hours to 24 hours, you wanna be asleep basically. You wanna be in a kind of no planning mode. So if you think about phase one, phase two, phase three in that way, you can start thinking about when you might wanna exercise. And if you're somebody who has a hard time motivating to exercise, believe it or not, putting it in the morning has this really cool effect, which is if you force yourself to exercise in the morning, one day, by day three, an internal timer, an activity-regulated circadian modulating timer through this really cool little structure in the brain called the intergeniculate leaflet will shift your circadian clock so that about that time, each day, you will be more alert. So we have feeding-induced clocks, we have light-induced clocks, we have exercise-induced clocks. Exercise and activity generally, but light is the main way that we organize those clocks. But by exercising the same time each day, you can generate predictable peaks in energy at those times of day. So I would say do it when you can do it consistently. And that ought to help. Yeah. Thank you so much for tonight, Professor Andrew. It was an amazing, amazing talk. And we'll see you again, guys, very, very soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.